We've spoken to an ambulance dispatcher at Northwest Ambulance Service who said to us that this job is now crushingly depressing, stressful, embarrassing. I feel destroyed. The feeling of saving lives has been taken over by how many we cannot kill. And they're saying that that's not due to COVID and that's not due to flu. That is due, they would say, to, to years of squeezing the funding on the NHS. Yeah, I think you look at, there's a more difference in terms of the pressure on the NHS pre-pandemic to what we are experiencing today. Uh, and that is something common across Europe. You can see that in other countries as well. And you can see that in the NHS in Wales. You can see that in Scotland. So, so that is not something that is unique to England. Respectfully, Secretary of State, this is excluding the pandemic, the worst year since 1951. And figures published yesterday showed the third consecutive week and more, more than 1,000 excess deaths in England and Wales and showed last year was one of the highest death totals in Britain ever recorded outside of the pandemic on the Conservative watch. What, for the love of God, has your party been doing for the last 13 years with the NHS? Well, what I'm saying is is uh, we don't accept those figures, I think. You don't uh, accept the NHS figures? In yesterday. So, no, the, the point is we're looking at those figures in terms of, for example, when you say over a 50-year period, obviously there's been very significant changes, both in terms of the demography, the numbers uh, within the population, but also the type of conditions that people have. We have a much older population, people uh, with multiple conditions, much more so than They have the old past. people in France, the Secretary of State. National lead for Unite saying that you only wanted to talk about productivity. Do you think that NHS workers should work harder to get a pay rise? Well, Productivity is not about working harder, it's about getting the system as a whole to work better. It's about, for example, the investment in technology. It's about enabling people who have had training to be focused on what that training is best for, rather than, for example, many of their frustrations with some of the administration, some of the bureaucracy, some of the things in the system that are not working as they should. And actually, that's common ground with the trade unions. The trade unions say to me, often they are frustrated on behalf of their members with some of the inefficiencies in the system. So it's right that we look at where can we work smarter, better, in a more effective way. But what we're keen to explore and have been exploring is where there's opportunities to go further through productivity, through efficiency, looking, for example, at the significant agency costs, looking where technology... It's offensive to nurses working 18-hour shifts, as you work. say... In inspecting patients or looking after patients in, in waiting rooms in awful conditions, going home and crying because they cannot give the care that they have been able to give up until now throughout their career. To ask them to make efficiency savings or better productivity when all they're saying is, hang on a minute, I cannot afford to eat properly at the moment. Nurses going to food banks and you're refusing to even discuss the issue. You just want to talk about next year. No. No, what we're saying is, is this coming year, the, the pay that would apply from April, and it's about how we get the whole yes, system working now. better. One of the things that nurses... Indeed, and, and that's what we're discussing with the trade unions in terms of how we get the, the interfaces, how we get more technology, how we ensure that people can be uh, avoiding what they say to me is often their frustration, the high cost of agency, uh, the technology that is not uh, enabling them to do their jobs as effectively as they want, many of the irritations in terms of... Uh, for example, having to phone around uh, to get information in hospitals. I was at Maidstone last week looking at uh, how much better it was for staff, where there's a control centre in place, where they've invested in technology, where they're able to get better flow into the hospital. So there's things we can do better uh, in terms of getting the system to work. That's what uh, the unions themselves said they want. If, God forbid, anyone you knew suffered a stroke today... What would the response be if you called 999? Well, the advice to any of your viewers, Susanna, is if it is a life-threatening incident, then they should phone 999. And we were working with the trade unions till midnight last night in terms of the uh, safety levels that they would cover. They've agreed to cover all the Category 1 uh, calls, which Stroke is, is the, the most... Category 2. It is. I was just coming on to that. So they've yeah. covered all the Category 1 uh, calls. Uh, category 2 is variable in some regions. The unions are saying in, in a number of region, regions they'll cover them entirely. In some areas, uh, it is subject to decisions taken in the control centre. So to take your example, the discussions we've had it with the trade unions is they would cover those 
calls. They say it's undemocratic, but lots of other European countries have them. Uh, and I don't hear them saying that France what is will undemocratic. What do, if, if people don't... Uh, if people ignore... Uh, break the law, basically, and go on strike? Well, firstly, what I'm saying is, is lots of other European countries have these. So when people say it's undemocratic, it is something that they have in France, they have in Italy, they have in Spain. Uh, and I don't think anyone's seriously suggesting these countries are undemocratic. But what we're saying is, if we look at the way the RCN have approached national arrangements for the strikes, they've acted very responsibly, to, to, to be fair to them, in terms of having a national arrangement in place. But as the far as my question is had... concerned, we only have a limited amount of time, yeah. Mr Barclay, as you know. Uh, what will you do if workers break the law and go on strike? Well, it, this is about having a safety net there, as they do in other U European countries, to ensure that there are minimum safety levels, minimum service levels in place. We will debate this in Parliament in terms of how this will apply. We're just looking at ambulances uh, in the first instance in terms of health. you're not going to people, are they, if they well, break the, the it, law and go it's on about, strike? You're just not going to prosecute them. It's so about it's the behaviour much more of unworkable. the unions. It's about the behaviour of the unions more than uh, individual members. Over time, a, a condition that is is less serious, can become very serious when there is a delay. And that's why we announced in the House of Commons yesterday that it is appropriate to have minimum service levels so we can be in a position okay, where... Sorry, Mr Barclay, are... I'm, talking, I, I'm not talking about legislation that you're intending to bring in at some point uh, in the future. I'm talking about today. OK. If I know someone who's having a stroke today, right now, are, you're basically saying that you cannot guarantee that an ambulance would come out within the time necessary to save that life? Well, we're saying that people firstly should phone 999 where there is a, a genuine life-threatening uh, incident. So your example, of course, they should phone uh, 999. We've been working with the trade unions in terms of what cover uh, they will provide. In I'm addition so, I, to Mr. that... Mr Barclay, I'm sorry, addition... what is the answer to the question? Can you guarantee, if someone I know has a stroke today, that if I call 999, an ambulance will arrive? 50,000 more deaths in the NHS over the past 12 months. Why is that? Well, all countries are, are looking uh, across Europe, uh, facing a, a similar issue is what is the consequence of the pandemic? Clearly, during the pandemic, there will be some patients uh, who delayed treatment, uh, particularly we're seeing some of that play through in uh, pressure on cardiovascular conditions. Uh, be some directly linked, some of those deaths, to COVID itself. Some of it may be indirectly where, for example, someone's waiting for treatment. Uh, we've got a, a challenge in terms of uh, people waiting for operations that we're working very actively to clear. So it's extremely complicated as to what the driver of those excess uh, deaths are. That's something we're looking closely. I'm talking to the chief medical officer. The... How alarmed are you by those numbers? Well, it's clearly concerning, but it's not something that's just affecting us in England. It's something no, I that's know, but all countries... 50,000 uh... people dead who, who perhaps wouldn't have been otherwise. You must be alarmed. Well, it's concerning that there are those, but clearly we knew at the time of the pandemic that in order to prevent further deaths, uh, deaths as a result of COVID, we needed to take a whole range uh, of very severe actions, and, and those had an impact.